The Qara, it's a divine GPS. We cannot go wrong with it. Because Allah will be in control of our heart after doing his Qara. So don't, don't worry about following the heart. And then put the complete reliance on Allah. That is the very critical thing that we need to communicate and teach our children. Uh, number three, take action. Brother Abdul Rashid is a leader because he took action and didn't just sit with his idea. Take action, be the best. And then, inshallah, we'll see more and more leaders. I'll conclude with this wonderful um, quote that uh, I feel very inspiring. It is not befitting for a Muslim to have low standards. I think we all agree that perhaps the biggest investment we can make in this environment is in our own children, both for the dunya and the hereafter, which is why we are all gathered here. So this applies to everybody, whether we are immigrant Muslims here or uh, native Muslims here. And perhaps sometimes the native Muslims understand the challenges better. Whereas the immigrants should also understand the big responsibility they have made because they made a choice in where their children will live. So it's a, it's a bigger responsibility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which they have to understand as much or even more than, than the indigenous. But everybody has to understand that and come up with the solution of how we can keep and raise the iman of our next, ourselves and our next generation. This is the bottom line. Because iman is the driving force. If the iman is high, then the results will come. If that energy is low, then no matter what you have, the results go down. So the question to all this is what will keep the Iman growing, or at least constant? Yeah. And the scholars answer that question, not me. Scholars say there's three things we need to do to have our Iman and our, uh, uh, the work, uh, our children and so on growing or stay constant. And what is that? Number one is, of course, dua to Allah SWT. Allah SWT is the one who controls the hearts. But that's just one part of it. The dua was everything. The Rasulullah SAW would have only made dua. No, but he made a lot of effort. What effort did he make? Again and again we heard that the effort is on making the right environment. It's not just knowledge. It's not just knowledge. The environment of Madina, the environment of Masjid Nawi was such that even prisoners tied to the post would become Muslim in at most three days. So there was something going around over there. There was an environment. Whereas what we have here is the opposite. One scholar was saying, that it's like you tie the hands and feet of a child and throw them in the water and say, don't get wet. How can they not get wet? The important thing is to teach the swimming so that they can cope with the wetness and the water around them. So, number one is to us, number two is working for an environment, and number three is teaching ourselves and others how to strive to change an, an, our environment and either change it something good or die trying to change that. Because if we do that, at least we will protect ourselves. Allah Subhanahu says in the Quran, Allah Jim, Those who strive in Allah's path, Allah will definitely, definitely guide them. So the success formula is there. It's not something new. And this is what Rasulullah came with. And this is what we have to emulate. Rasulullah is recorded and said in the Hadith, That I was raised as a teacher. I was raised as a teacher. So this is the job. Teaching is not a profession. Teaching is not a word. Teaching is the job of the Prophet And we have to understand that this has to be done by example. As was said by the, uh, the brothers before me, uh, more eloquent, eloquently, we have to teach by example. And it's a partnership between teachers and parents. Parents' role is extremely important, especially the mother's role especially the mother's road, who are able to give quality time to the child, who are the first university of the child. So mother's road is extremely important, and you see time and again stories of big scholars of Islam, big waliullahs, what was the role of their mother in shaping their lives. This, this is history we have to look and understand and learn from. So my next point is that we have to look at Islam as a comprehensive framework 
most of the time, and I'm not saying about Tarbiya school, Mashallah Tarbiya school is doing exactly what we need, and we need it at everywhere. But many times Islamic education is confined to Aqidah and, uh, and, and Ibadah. You know, okay, you believe in this and we do the, 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 uh, the five pillars. Okay, but that's just a starting point. That's the starting point. We have to have our mission is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our vision is to follow the Sunnah way for success in this life and the hereafter. That has to be implemented. So Aqidah is a starting point. Amal is what follows next. But after that, there are mamalat, our dealings, as was mentioned by people before me. How do, how do we deal with each other? What's our collective way of life, our mashara? What's our economic system? What's our political system? What's our social life? And here let me also point out that Islam has its unique way of balance. Islam has a complementary relationship between the men and the women. It's not like the American ideal of equality meaning identicalness. No. Islam has equality of men and women before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Equality to, reach, to achieve the highest state of the Jannah. But in the dunya, there is a complementary role, which we are not realizing today because of which the problems we mentioned before, the failing marriages, the social strife, the, all these things that happen. So a part of our Islamic education is not only aqidah and ibadah, it's also our ma'amalat, it's also our mashira, our collective way of life. Allah has given responsibility for a father, for a mother, for a husband, for a brother, for a sister for an uncle, and so on and so forth. Mr. Salam, he showed in every way of his life how a best Muslim should operate. As a commander, as a neighbor, he showed all those roles, and we have to understand from those roles, and from the Ummahat al the mothers of the believers. So this is something we have to learn, and also finally the akhlaq, the character. The character building is a part of our deen. So let's not confine ourselves to the, 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 the five pillars or the, or the beliefs. No, there's much more. There's much more to our deen, which has to be a part and parcel, and that's what will show our non-Muslims what Islam is. Muslims went to countries where they didn't even know the language of that country, yet they changed the entire country to Islam. How was that done? By their character, by their dealings, by their behavior. And we have to prove, not by our words, but by our behavior, that we are following Rasulullah sallallahu who was rahmatullah al the mercy to the words. The American society will not come and watch our salah and siyam and hajj and zakah. They will see how do we deal with them. Are we beneficial for the society or not? And that's the answer. That's the answer to gain our position as Muslims, as leaders of society. We have to prove ourselves that we love the society, the love the human beings at large. We are sent not for Muslims. We are the ummah which is sent for mankind. We are the best of nations who are sent for mankind. Who enjoy the good, forbid the evil, and believe Allah. So there is a complete packet we have to work on, inshallah. And for that, yes, Islamic schools are very important. Because Islamic schools give us a base to teach all these things. Islamic schools uh, have a huge role to play in this. And here I want to mention that I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, as uh, Dr. Naveed mentioned, the challenges. Yes, there are challenges. Uh, we have very few Islamic schools right now. I would, I would say we need much, much, much larger number. But how to do it? How to do it? Resources is an issue, and we'll, we'll hear from our respective brother about that, inshallah. But the message I want to give is that simplicity. Simplicity. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid was the madrasa, was the parliament, was the, the seat of justice was so many things in a very, very simple and humble structure, which had not even a proper roof, so that when the rain would come, they would have dirt on their forehead when doing such things. So it's not about having the best building. It's not having about the best infrastructure, but it is about having the best zeal, the best uh, implementation of Quran and, and Sunnah. It's about simplicity. And for that, it doesn't matter if we start with a few kids in the house. Our own Islamic school, we started with four children in, a, in an apartment, Alhamdulillah. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. And this is, I would like all of us to think there are many, many, many areas which don't have an Islamic school and they have to start somewhere. But instead of waiting for a building, waiting for this and that, start with a core group of families coming up together in a homeschooling system. You know, in America, non-Muslims, between one and two million non-Muslims are doing homeschooling. And they are doing performing better than the regular school. And they're going to better colleges than the regular school. Why? Because of the passion, because they have the will. So it's the simplicity which is very, very important. Don't wait to have the best building and the best budget and the best resources and the best PhDs. No, no. 
start simple, start small, ask Allah and make sure and keep on going one step after another, inshallah. And, and by the way, which also reminds me that our school, Islamic school, we support homeschooling for people who are not able to come. And I, I wish all Islamic schools were to play that role because Islamic schools have to reach out beyond this immediate client time. Okay? Now, we can use internet, but the... No, your school is interactive or not? Interact the, the homeschooling program, you mean? Yes. No, the homeschooling program is not interactive. It is based on in empowering and helping groups of families who are committed, giving them the curriculum, giving them the exams, giving them the guidance, giving them the training, and so on and so forth. It's not centralized. It's a very, very decentralized system. So it's not, and I can talk more about that. But let me just finish with a few things because I have very limited time here. What I am seeing has been done practically in other countries. Sister talked about UK, she attended a, a conference, mashallah, and showed such good examples. But in my mind, there are two countries in the world today, which are non-Muslim countries, where Muslims have achieved what we would like to see achieved in America. So we have to learn from it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We, can, we have to learn from it. UK, England is one of them, and South Africa is another. So we have to learn from what these Muslims have done. And South Africa, initially, they were the same. They had the same problems. They had the next generation Muslim problems. They had the problem of keeping the children you know, Muslim. <coughs> same problems like in South America and so on. But they did something differently. And they have achieved now the rate where, Alhamdulillah, there's no, no issue of the next generation you know, or, uh, leaving Islam or anything like that. Alhamdulillah, they've achieved it. So the question is, how did these countries achieve it? And just to learn from, from their effort, there is a few things they did. One is a very strong, basic dawah and tablil effort, which means that everyone should aim to become a da'i of Allah. Da'i in Allah. Everyone. You know, that, that's the aim. You know, it, it could be done in a very simple fashion. Not everybody has to be a scholar. You know, Rasulullah is a reporter has said, Ballego ani balo ayah. Even if you know one ayah, convey to others. It's the thought, it's the effort, which makes the person himself or herself strong. So we have to aim to, for every one of us to become a da'i in Allah. And that's an effort made in this country. And once that is done, then of course building the institutions including Islamic schools, including homeschooling networks. But let's also not forget the 90% plus people who are not coming to Islamic schools. That is also a very important part of the Ummah. And at least for a very long foreseeable future, we have to make a lot of figure and concern for them. And one, one, some of the way, ways this has been done in these countries is by establishing after-school maktabs. After-school programs where the children come directly from the public school to the masjid or to the Islamic school and they learn. More than learn, they get the environment. They see all the other Muslims around them. Here in America that can be done and I'm not saying I have done it or we have done it but it's a goal I would like all of us to work towards. Here it's very easy. Public school bus can drop the child to anywhere you ask them to. They don't have to drop the child back to the home. We can ask the public school to drop the child to an Islamic school and establish the after school program. And, and work on that, inshallah. So this is one project I want everybody to think about because while we are working on the Islamic schools, let's not forget the 90 plus, plus percent students. Another project I would like all of us to work on, inshallah, is Juma in the public schools. Alhamdulillah, most colleges now have MSAs, uh, most colleges have Juma. But remember, our high school students are Balim. By Islamic standards, they are adults. Juma is for them. And how can we expect someone who hasn't gone for Juma for 18 years of his life to suddenly come and start doing it? A lot of loss is happening today is because of lack of Juma prayer and Islamic clubs in public schools. And it, but it, it's coming back. It's happening. Alhamdulillah, in Old Bridge, where I am, now there is Juma. My, my, some of our children, mashallah, they went to, uh, to uh, Allied Health Magnet School. We just had about four or five students there. And mashallah, they started Juma there. It's not that the public school is a hindrance. If there's a will, there's a way. You just talk to the, 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 the people and it happens. There's not a big obstacle over there. And I can see from my own personal experience that it happened in these two places. And I'm sure it's happening in many, many places. So I don't want to take a long uh, uh, time. I know there's many valuable uh, points to be made by many speakers here, inshallah. But to summarize, we have to work on du'as, environment, and dawah and tablil effort. And while we do that, we focus on not only the aqidah and, um, and, and, and the pillars, but also on the mamilat, the dealings, the mashallah, the collective way of life, and akhlaq. Especially aiming towards the wider society we are living in, 
showing the example of Prophet Muhammad as Rahmatullah Alameen and demonstrating by our family units also that yes, there is a role which, which Allah has ordained for men and there is a role which Allah has ordained for women and they are complementary roles and they are very, very, each is a uniquely valuable role to inculcate that in our, in our, in our children, inshallah. Uh, and finally, uh, our Islamic schools, as Dr. Talat mentioned, they have to have this system where Islam permeates top to bottom. Their mission has to be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their vision has to be to follow their success life in following the Muslim in every aspect of his life. And, and the last part is while we are working on the Islamic schools, let's not forget the others outside. It has focused on at least these two projects, the Juma in the public school and the after school Makatib, uh, inshallah. Which is Akhmul Lakhir. Which is Akhmul Lakhir. Which is Akhmul Let me, uh, let me uh, give you an, a brief overview of uh, how we have been trying to do, uh, do this at Um when we when we uh, thought about having this um, panel discussion and focusing on raising future leaders, uh, it it came to our mind that that we should learn from Quran. How is leader defined in Quran? So I did a quick search uh, to for the word leader in Quran. Now th there have been uh, different words in Arabic that have been used, but there there anything that can be translated as leaders. I searched for that. And I found uh, 34 places, 34 places in Quran which have used the word that can, can be roughly, uh, roughly or directly translated as leaders. And <clears throat> it was very interesting. 29 times out of that 34, this is how Quran talks about leaders. The leaders the arrogant party among among his people said, O Shuev. Pe leader directly fo being followed by arrogant people. Um, and, and another place, uh, 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 Quran says, um, Sure, we people, they rejected the ayah, the proof, their Lord, and disobeyed his messenger and followed uh, command of every uh, proud oppressor. That's what Quran talks 29 times out of 34. The only five times where leadership, one time uh, talking about Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Quran says, uh, inna, inna Ibrahim akana ummatan kana that, 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 was, that was the first time I found that Quran and Allah was talking about leaders in a positive manner. And, uh, and then four other places where characteristics of leaders are described. So it was a very interesting uh, uh, situation for me to, to look at these things and, and wonder about these things. Why, why are leaders uh, mentioned in a negative connotation so many times? And when I think about it, I feel that it is because it is very easy for a leader to become arrogant. It is very easy for, for a leader to, um, uh, to fall victim of, um, uh, of ego and, 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 and all, the, all the bad things. So being leader is a, very, uh, uh, is a very challenging task. So how do we achieve it? We go back uh, to Quran and we find out that even though uh, the word leader is only mentioned 34 times, all the stories, all the Qasas al they are all about uh, the, the training program for, for uh, those uh, prophets. And we know, I think we can all agree that all prophets were leaders, right? Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. That, that all prophets were leaders. Correct. And we read about those stories and we find out that they were being trained by Allah. For example, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he's going with his family sees uh, um, a fire on a mountain. Nobody else can see, only he can see. And he says, okay, you wait here, let me go and, and find out. So he goes and, um, and it's, uh, it's dark, there's nobody there, and all of a sudden, sound comes. Musa. Now, we, we, uh, we know that most of the time we associate calling somebody uh, by the name at the beginning of a sentence with uh, 
um, if it's snubbing someone. For example, my son, if he's doing something wrong, I don't even have to say, stop it. All I have to say, Ahmed. And he'll stop. So Allah SWT is starting Musa. And then uh, Allah SWT asks him, take your shoes off. Throw your ass up. And then Allah SWT says, uh, now pick up this uh, snake. Now just imagine, if we were in that situation, what would happen? That somebody is telling us, pick up a snake. A, a snake which, which looks alive and is moving. And it's, a, it's not a small snake, it's a big snake. And he's asking us to pick it up. And we are talking about leader, leader like Musa. He's being told. So, so that's where I found that there was a lesson that before he became a leader, what was he doing? What was he, was he, what was he, what was he becoming? A follower. He was listening. He was following the commands. And only then he became a leader. And not just Prophet uh, Musa alayhi salam, look at the story of um, uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, being thrown in fire. And, and commandment is that, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I mean, this, this is one of the biggest fires ever. And uh, he's being told, don't worry about it. So, uh, and, and he believes in that. And not just that, uh, commandment for, um, for sacrificing his son. That was no, no little deal. That was a big deal. But that was the training program that Allah SWT was giving to, to his messengers. So that they could have become leaders. Story of Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam. Story of, of, of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the difficulties that he went through. He became a leader because he became a follower. And, and that's, that's where it started. So, so, so keeping that in mind, we started uh, uh, Islam, Tabiya Islamic School. And the concept of Islamic School, we related that concept to this uh, word in Quran that, that talks about Shajra Tayyibah. Shajra Tayyibah, which is translated in a number of ways, a good word, advice, guidance, education. That Shajra Tayyibah is a tree that has deep roots and healthy growth. We cannot, we cannot build an Islamic school or an Islamic institution where we say, okay, okay, let's just go back to the basics and learn and forget about everything else. That's, that's talking about roots, right? right? Strong roots. But we are forgetting the growth. And then there's this uh, second school of thought that, that would say that forget about the past. Focus on future. That's, that's where the growth is. That's where the technology and, and all, all the things that uh, the world is moving toward, that's what we need to do. But that does not, that growth alone, upward growth does not make uh, a tree Shajra Tayyibah. Shajra Tayyibah is only when it has strong roots and uh, healthy growth upwards. Now, without going much into the philosophical details of the Tarbiya philosophy, let me, let me emphasize on just two things. Uh, the concept of Ta'aleem and Tarbiya. These two, these two words, are they go hand in hand. And we'll see that uh, Islamic literature on education talks about these two things all the time. Ta'aleem and Tarbiya. Now, Ta'aleem is when when, for example, I'm a professor at the University of Delaware, I go uh, to my class, I deliver a lecture, I'm done, my job is fulfilled. I have earned halal risk because I have done what, what I was expected to do. That's ta'aleem. And the root word comes from, the uh, root word of ta'aleem is alama. And actually, uh, yesterday I found out, uh, Sister Mariam, she mentioned that, that that root word is also the root word for uh, the Arabic word that is used to describe secularism. Alama. The second word, tarbiya, the root word is rabba. The sustainer, the, the guider. And, and if you look at it, that's what... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was doing to his prophets. He was training them. He was giving them tarbiyah program so that they could become leaders. So based upon that, um, my understanding of tarbiyah is that the tarbiyah starts when 
in my class of 50 students, I find out that you know these two, three students, they are excellent students. And if I help them just a little bit more, they could become great leaders. So I, I talk to them, hey, would you, would you like to write a paper? There's this conference, maybe it'll, uh, it'll, it'll help you uh, channel your, your energies, your intellect. And then I take personal interest in their growth. That's where Tarbiha begins. That I have a vested interest in the success of that child, of that student. So that's where we, we begin uh, the concept of Tarbiya. Um, just a brief history, we started in November 2010, uh, February 2011, we opened admission. We started with four children, uh, two of my own uh, daughters and uh, one, of, one of our friend's daughter and daughter of uh, the teacher that we hired with those four. In February 2011, we started, we, op we opened the admissions and by June 2011, uh, when the summer program started, we had 37 kids and, and we could not, by that time, until that time we were doing it from our home. So we had to move out because we had grown too fast, uh, too much. So, so Alhamdulillah Santala made it easy. We, we got this building which was a, a training center for Chrysler. Chrysler shut down, so this building was available. So Allah Santala made this arrangement for us. Uh, we started with, uh, with a little more than 55 students uh, in September. And Alhamdulillah, uh, people have been uh, looking at what we are doing. And people have been seeing what, what children are learning. And every, every single uh, week, we, we are getting more and more admission. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, last week, uh, we have more admissions than we probably have crossed the, uh, the 100. Uh, uh, more, we, we probably have more than 100 kids right now. Um, so, so how do we do it? How do we do it? Uh, we, focus on, we focus on technology in the classroom because we do not want the, the growth aspect. We do not want our students, our children to fall behind. Uh, we, we use online textbooks, web resources. We have homework uh, management system that our teachers use extensively. And, and, and they not only use extensively, they know which parents are using it and which parents are not using it. So every parent-teacher meeting, they, they have a report of all the, all the parents who have, who have not used that system. So they, they tell them, you have not been using the system. You need to. So, so all those parents are, are involved with that system. Uh, classroom environment, here is a typical classroom environment. This is a science class. Um, this is a typical day at school. We emphasize, we emphasize a lot on the co-curricular activities. Now, co-curricular activities uh, to, to make them hard, to make it clear to them that they are going, this is their home, and they have to understand the system and society so that they could become leaders. They could, they could solve the problems that this society has not solved in, in, uh, in a long time. Those issues still exist. I mean, we, we may want to call call it you know uh, superpower and all that stuff, but and developed country. But, but to me, it's a very elusive concept that we should call ourselves developed country when we have solved all the social problems. Have we? Have we solved social problems in this country? The 49 million people go go without food on their table every day. Millions of people do not have health insurance. Who? Huh? So, that's right. So, who is going to solve these problems? Are we not part of this society? If we are to create an Islamic environment, it has to be something that Prophet Muhammad created. And that was a society that did not consist of Muslims alone. That society consisted of Jews. It consisted of Christians. And Muslims served as the leaders. They, they provided, they created that environment where they felt comfortable and they, they understood that, that uh, uh, Muslims were a vital part of the society. And, and how did it happen? Because they, they followed Allah's commandment. So for our leaders, for our future leaders, it is very important that they understand that before they become leaders, they have to be followers. Uh, so co-curricular activities, um, you know, they have gone to a uh, uh, number of um, uh, institutions, the police department, the fire, fire department, um, uh, museums, 
Um, so all kind of things that you can think of, uh, our, our children do that. Uh, a strong presence on social media, um, uh, our Facebook page, videos, our videos have more than 40,000, uh, 43,000 hits uh, so far. And these are videos of children telling, explaining what they have learned in an activity. Um, similarly, community activities that, that we, are, we, are, we are not um, just a school that this is an institution and and that is that is the reason we bring uh, we bring uh, the community we bring the experts together so that we can have a collective reflective so that the school is is truly an institution that thinks about these things and not just go about you know uh, things that we think may be true uh, so how have we done this so far uh, right now, we are um, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have an organizational structure. This location we have is one year lease. We have pre-K to, to sixth grade so far. Um, our uh, finances, budget-wise, our income is um, this, this. These numbers are uh, a few months old. Uh, our income is about sixteen thousand uh, dollars. Our expenses. Uh, are about eighteen thousand dollars, so approximately uh, approximately two thousand dollars deficit uh, every month. And how how are we financing it right now? We are financing it because a lot of parents they paid upfront at the beginning of the school year, so that's how we are financing. We'll probably need to do something, and that's where we will uh, need community support. Uh, next year we want to uh, we want to start uh, uh, pre K to eighth grade, uh, maybe even ninth grade. There, there has been some push. Some parents have been coming in and they have been asking for to start the, the high school process. Um, financially, we would like to break even. Uh, and fundraisers in five years, uh, we would like to have a full-fledged uh, Islamic school, uh, high school, uh, with maybe more than 200 uh, students, um, a, a surplus, a, fi a, a, a financial surplus. Now, how do we manage this thing uh, financially? It is because of two women, um, Dr. Amna Latif and uh, Sister Mariam, and uh, along with them, all the teachers who have been working in the school uh, with with a mission. Sister Mariam and Sister uh, and Amna, they do not get paid. They, they they have not taken a single penny in pay for all the work. They are here. Uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning and sometimes at as late as 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the night because they have to uh, to get things ready for so that when children come in, they, those things are ready for them. So with that um, explanation, I hope it will give a little, a little bit more perspective uh, to what do we mean by leadership and, uh, and I hope you could reflect that in your questions and in your comments, inshallah. Uh, let me give to uh, Brother um, uh, Ramiz Dugar. Brother Ramiz Dugar, as I told you, uh, he the, the issue of financial um, uh, uh, problems, challenges is very near and dear to him, and he has uh, uh, he, he, he has worked with the school system, not just with one school, with with a number of humanitarian organizations, uh, and I would like him to elaborate on this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> first of all, I thank you all for making this event possible, especially the Terbia School. And I would like everyone, when I, when I all the time, oh, in all my life, I mean, half of my life, I, I have tried. So, and when I I want people to listen. I want to promise you to listen. And I want you to promise that you will tell others what you heard to them. Everybody in the same page here, are we going to promise that all of us will tell one brother or sister that what we heard today? Inshallah. Take me Inshallah, brother. I will not ask you, if you think that we said something nice, please say. If we said something bad, please keep it for yourself. Brother, I want to start with the sh short surah. 
that made very big difference in my life, which is well as and uh, a, a sheikh that is origin from Albania, he now is is past. May Allah, inshallah, give Jannah. He talked about it, and I listened last night about this. He talked about the Surah Al Asr, and he talked about the most important thing in the life, in any life. It's time. There are three things that we have to know, brothers and sisters. We have nothing to do. We cannot change. Nothing about the beginning of our life. No one asked us, do we want to be born or not? And no one will ask us, do we want to die? None of us. But makes no difference. We will. And in this context, I just want to remind you that the only thing in our lives that we can make a difference, it's time. And what we can do with this time. The best calculators in the world, if they can go and find technology, they will never know what time and how much time they have to do good deeds. And the best deed that we can give is to With this, you know, when we started, I want to start with this, because time was very important in our school, when we started our school. And the reason that I'm here, and the best time of my life, that I always say, Oh Allah, please, give me more time to do what I have done in the time that we were trying and to make it happen in our community to have a school, an Islamic school, an Islamic environment. And this, our community, Albanian community in Staten Island, if no one knows, we, were, we are a big community, but we 